the idea is that um, over this period of a century, uh, as you know, the overall uh, uh, flight history has been about 120 years. So in the 100, and 100 years, let's take from um, 1916 or 1917 onwards to uh, 2016, 2017, about five years back, uh, which is what the data I could gather uh, over here. Uh, maybe some other sources would have even more later data. But uh, you can generally see the trend. What is happening is that, as we already saw, uh, uh, compared to the 1910s and 1920s aircraft, we are flying much faster. We are flying a longer distance. We are flying with more passengers, so heavier aircraft. The overall idea is that the payload the fuel, because for range you need more and more fuel. And uh, also uh, you have evolved in terms of the controls uh, into fly-by-wire and many other technologies. The avionics occupies much more weight today compared to, even though the overall avionics have been miniaturized and there's a lot of reduction, but in terms of the number of uh, sensors and or instrumentation that goes with it, that has also increased. So to, um, if you t think of the overall aircraft maximum takeoff weight as 100%, you are essentially distributing between these various things. In addition, you have the, what is the focus of, of this course, that is the structural weight. So the percentage of weight that is allocated for the structure uh, is something that has evolved over a period of time. In addition, if you look at the propulsion, the engine weight, uh, or the total engine system, uh, it's not just the engine, but the pylons, the weight is attached to the rest of the fuel system, etc. Not the fuel itself, but the, uh, the connections, uh, and the controls from the pilot in terms of the thrust control. Uh, you typically see that that has also gone through uh, quite a bit of reduction in terms of the percentage weight. So uh, overall aircraft maximum takeoff weight, if you take as 100%, uh, the contribution from the structures and the contribution from the engines have been two areas where we have tried to cut down so that we can increase the other things, which is what is more attractive to the uh, end buyer, you know, whether it's military to take more ammunition or it is uh, the passenger aircraft to take more passengers or, or cargo aircraft to take more cargo weight. In all these cases, and also a longer range aircraft where you want to fly longer and therefore take more fuel, though the engine efficiencies have improved. When, whenever you want to fly a much longer distance, obviously you need to take much more fuel with you. Um, or if it's a reconnaissance like mission in the military, you probably need more endurance, and once again, that means fuel. So you know, all these, you have to, out of the total 100%, you have to find a place where you can uh, chop off or do what is called as a cost cutting uh, in terms of a weight to uh, bring it towards these uh, useful or utilitarian things, which is what is the very purpose of flying. Uh, and that evolution has happened over a long period of time, and uh, you can see the effects. Even when we talk about the engine uh, weight reduction as a percentage, um, a lot has uh, been contributed primarily from the materials and structures point of view. Is the material and structure which is used to make the various um, aircraft engine components, which has come down uh, in terms of its overall weight penalties, and that's why uh, the, the success that we see. Now, uh, so one is in terms of how much you want to allocate for that. The other is also in terms of the overall uh, uh, behavior of the aircraft as a whole. If you're looking at um, a typical way in which you start the design, one of the things uh, that you do is you do a literature survey where you take into account very similar aircraft of that category, and then you just create a database and try to look at it. And one of the important parameters for comparison for similar kind of aircraft, apart from the functionality, is the fact that you look into what is known as a wing loading. The wing loading is a very, very important parameter, typically the maximum takeoff weight divided by the platform area of the wing. Now the platform area of the wing uh, for a rectangular uh, platform is very simple, it's the, just the uh, span times the uh, cord that you have, uh, whereas typically for most aircraft today you have uh, tapered wings mm, and swept wings, so obviously you need to appropriately calculate that. Typically a mean aerodynamic cord is involved and along with the aspect ratio and the span you have a way of calculating the platform area. Uh, 
Um, now, uh, of course, the aircraft can fly at various orientations, the pitch angle in particular, where uh, what you see from the top angle could be quite different, it could reduce, but it's essentially the crew that crews whatever you're essentially looking at as the planform area, that is what you typically take as the planform area. Now this factor, the wing loading, uh, that is weight, total maximum takeoff weight of the uh, aircraft uh, divided by the uh, planform area has also undergone an evolution in the same period, 1916 to 2016, and that has gone through a huge increase. So this is essentially saying that for the same amount of, uh, or same size of wing, I want to take more uh, weight of the aircraft. And with the better materials and the better geometric designs, especially moving from uh, the truss-like designs and monocoque-like designs to the semi-monocoque, we have been able to cater to this higher wing loading requirement as well. Now, uh, in moving uh, <coughs> towards uh, greater and greater wing loading, you're also seeing that uh, in at, you would have otherwise, if nothing had changed, you would have uh, required that the structural weight percentage should be more. But it has uh, been beaten in two different ways. In terms of the demand from the structures and materials, it's a lot more than before. And in terms of what is allocated for the structures and materials in terms of the weight percentage of the overall aircraft is also reducing. So it's been a very, very challenging journey. But, and it's to the credit of a lot of ingenious uh, aerospace engineers, materials engineers, structural engineers, who have uh, tried to cater to this requirement. One, as I said, is in the motion from uh, the truss and monocoque to semi-monocoque. The other is in terms of the materials that have been used as well, you know, to start with fabric, wood, etc., to aluminum alloys, and then uh, uh, other kinds of alloys like titanium, uh, few steels, etc., which continue to be used. And most importantly, in the almost uh, for a half a century, it's been the composites that have been used. Many people don't realize that composites have as long a history as half a century as far as aer aerospace engineering is concerned. We always keep, keep saying that that was a conventional material, traditional material, but today composites are also becoming, especially GFRP, CFRP, are <coughs> used almost uh, in a common place. Uh, even, in, even when the uh, requirements are not very, very uh, stringent in terms of the performance or stability or control. So it's become almost uh, uh, something that you use on a common basis. So these are the solutions using which we have come so far. And it is possible, uh, looking at the trend, that we might have to uh, even further reduce the w uh, structural weight uh, penalty to have greater and greater overall uh, aircraft performance. So that's what I mean by carry more with less. Uh, you're carrying more payload, carrying more fuel, uh, carrying more avionics, but with less amount of structural weight in terms of percentages. <coughs> so, uh, in fact, you'd be surprised that over this period, 1916 to 2016, uh, the uh, wing loading uh, on an average uh, has increased 13 times. It's, in other words, 1,300% is what it is today compared to 1916. Uh, what it was in 2016 uh, was that maybe it's 14 or 15 today in today's designs. But essentially, that's a huge, huge uh, increase. Uh, couldn't have even dreamt about at that stage um, you know, when, we were when we had just started flying as a, uh, as a human race, we, it, uh, the kind of uh, evolution that has happened. Because evolution typically in the natural scale happens over millennia, not century, uh, or here not even centuries, but just a single century over which this kind of a performance increase uh, has happened. So kudos to the engineers and uh, the material scientists who have been uh, involved uh, in this overall uh, process. Because one is, of course, many others have contributed in terms of the aerodynamicist uh, better airfoil designs. Uh, better planform designs, the sweep angle, other things, a lot of things that we didn't know about earlier in terms of, let's say, for faster supersonic aircraft, etc., the wave drag, etc. Many of these things uh, were discovered and worked upon in terms of better solutions uh, in terms of the overall shaping of the aircraft uh, over a long period of time. Uh, similarly, stability and control uh, in terms of how you provide that stability in terms of the stabilizations, the control surfaces, and how uh, the control surface is design goes into and how the transfer of control from the pilot to the uh, control surfaces happens. All of these have, of course, contributed in a huge way, but 
probably the biggest contribution, if you look at in terms of uh, catering to this, has been from the materials and structures point of view. One is because for the overall aircraft, be it the fuselage, wings, or the empennage, but also towards the uh, engine materials, uh, especially high temperature ma capability materials that we have developed over a period of time. So how uh, this is 13 times, uh, and as I said, uh, that is as far as the demand is concerned from the structural designer that uh, you have to cater to a larger wing loading. Now in terms of the supply, what is, uh, what is the resource with which you can uh, cater to such a huge demand or such a huge change in demand in terms of requirements? Yes, the structural weight has dropped from what it used to be in 1916, 1917 uh, period, uh, about 30 to 40%. They're given a huge range because there are so many different aircraft and some were better in structural performance closer to 30 and some were a little more inferior in terms of the material and structural performance towards 40. So essentially that is the range that you're talking about or an average you can think of about 25 percent, sorry 35 percent. But uh, uh, about five years back this number had already, this percentage rather had already come down to 22 to 25 percent which is uh, really remarkable and uh, as I said I don't have data for the last five years but uh, based on the kind of trends, especially in the more recent times we have seen, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, it's of the order of 20% now. That's essentially, you're saying that one-fifth of the aircraft weight is the structural uh, weight, the materials which go into load bearing, that is, offer certain strength, stiffness, stability for the overall aircraft to uh, remain in integral, uh, the integrity of the aircraft, structural integrity has to be maintained with that small an amount, which essentially means why also indicates how the performance uh, in terms of ranges and speeds and uh, payload capabilities have uh, increased tremendously. So a pat on the backs for the structural engineers involved. The, um, as I said, the material uh, is one thing, the structural design in terms of uh, semi, not only moving to semi-monocoque constructions, but also in terms of the shaping that you have. Uh, because if you look at, after, even after the material or materials uh, more specifically have been selected for various structural uh, uh, components, uh, next thing you have to do is the shaping, the sizing, uh, the spacing of these because between one stringer to another or between one uh, rib to another uh, pictures of which we saw in the cutaways last time has to be decided. So all of these have to be accounted for um, and uh, that is, is not purely material design alone. There's a lot that materials have contributed, but also the geometry has uh, changes that we have done. And the, um, uh, in terms of individual component geometry, the cross-sectional geometries, et cetera, uh, the way they have been uh, uh, spaced out, and also how they have been joined to each other, the joining technologies. All of this comes under this paradigm, which has helped this uh, evolution take place. So if you look at uh, pictorially, what, what we are just talking about is essentially, uh, you can see in terms of the magnitudes, what, what has happened, the wing loading uh, in Newton per meter squared. So typically, even though say, we say weights, many a times we use it in uh, kg, you know, which is the mass rather than the weight. But then if you look, convert it uh, using the acceleration due to gravity to the actual weight, it's uh, the unit typically is Newton per meter squared. And in 1917, uh, it was of the order of 350. Of course, there will be a range, but we're talking of some ballpark values just for comparison sake of a similar kind of aircraft. And uh, you see that uh, in 2016, the same thing has become so large. It's almost as high as 4,800 uh, Newton per meter squared. So that's the huge increase of almost 13 times that we are talking about. Now, on the other hand, the structural weight percentage, which was allocated to the to the materials and structures uh, design teams, was uh, just about 35 percent to start with. And now uh, it's, uh, which is essentially the average I'm looking at over there. Whereas now it's uh, it's it's around 22, or maybe it could be lesser than that uh, in more recent times. So this is the uh, huge change in terms of the demand and supply that you have to keep in mind as engineers when we innovate. Um, it, uh, the requirements uh, or how it is defined to us by the rest of the uh, overall team um, 
can become more and more stringent and what we are allocated in order to, in terms of resources, to cater to it. Here we're talking of material resources, structural resources, but also includes the time that you take in order to accomplish a certain task. That has come down drastically thanks to the kind of experimental testing facilities that have improved, the computational facilities have improved, both in terms of hardware and software. So the time to market has come down drastically in terms of designs. Also, we have a lot of history in terms of what we have learned from the previous designs, and we take over or carry over a lot of these uh, this knowledge into the uh, future aircraft. For example, LCA, uh, many people uh, complain that it took a very long period of time to uh, design. But if you look at the AMCA, a lot of things that uh, the LCA kind of conceptual design and also the detailed design, uh, what uh, the learning process happened for the teams, that has been carried over and you see you know, much faster uh, development of the AMCA. So it happens not only uh, in uh, a country like India, but also you look at uh, the history of the first fighters that were developed in, uh, uh, whether it's in the US or in Europe, you see that there have been huge uh, time overruns. It's not just military aircraft. If you look at even the, um, the cutting edge aircraft that we talked about in passenger aircraft that I showed you models of earlier, Boeing 787 or uh, Airbus A350, which have more than 50% by weight of uh, composites and uh, almost 70% by volume. In those cases also, there were huge time overruns. Uh, uh, what they initially started off saying when it will be available uh, in the market to when it actually was available. There, was a, uh, there were many, many years. And, but still, compared to what could have been uh, the case for similar aircraft design, let's say 50, 60, 70 years ago, compared to now, there's a huge reduction in uh, the cost. So, so resources include not only structures and materials, but the time uh, to market. The next is the human human resources that are spent, the uh, amount of money that is spent on the project out uh, to get out a particular aircraft. All of these are resources that you have to uh, remember. And there are constraints or uh, more and more stringent constraints, rather, that are coming up with each one of these resources. Uh, you're looking at a lot of these um, big companies, they're cutting down on the number of employees and things like that. So there's a shortage in human resources with which you are supposed to work as a team. Um, similarly, in terms of the money allocation for uh, considering the amount of payoff it's going to have eventually in the market. Again, the margins are coming down. One, uh, because of the technologies that we are developing. The second is in terms of the competition in the market. Earlier, it was almost like a monopoly, a big company like Boeing dominating the entire market. Then Airbus came, and then so many other smaller companies in Brazil, Indonesia, etc., which are all uh, giving them a run for the money in terms of um, they have probably lesser labor cost. Um, but again, you also need to look at in terms of the materials availability. That has become a very, very stringent thing. For example, um, uh, one of the uh, materials that we um, uh, can use to enhance uh, engine performance, especially in the combustor and the turbine region, is silicon carbide. So silicon carbide fibers are something that, uh, again, uh, there are many uh, classes or categories of silicon carbide fibers depending upon mm, uh, the kind of application. So what we are talking of is aerospace grade uh, silicon carbide fibers. Uh, these are available uh, uh, as of today only in three countries, US, Japan, and uh, France. US GE makes it, and Japan uh, Nippon makes it, and in France Snegma makes it. The names of these countries, uh, if you take it's something that you see in terms of the geopolitics. Uh, these are amongst the more friendly countries as far as India is concerned. But still, we have not been able to obtain the space grade uh, or aerospace grade for that matter, aeronautical grade or space grade uh, silicon carbide uh, fibers that we want. So there's a lot of uh, geopolitics involved. And also, these can change over time. So when you do it is also very, very important. When your project is developing, what kind of geopolitical scenario remains at that time, all that comes into mind. So it's very important for engineers to look at these economic aspects, the geopolitical aspects, etc., as well keep them in mind. Uh, because when you're selecting materials, there might be materials on paper which are the best for a particular uh, component that you're going to design, but whether you will have that material available or not. You might have it available today, but the supply might cut off a little later. Like what 
is happening, for example, in the semiconductor uh, supply chain issues uh, ongoing currently, uh, suddenly there's a huge reduction and uh, companies which have a demand for this in large quantities have to look at alternate options. So you have to keep backup plans and uh, uh, as far as possible, see if you can build it with your indigenous resources. So these are the directions in which uh, many of these countries with large interest in aerospace are uh, going towards. So any uh, questions or doubts on this particular slide? We'll move on otherwise. Okay. Yeah, before um, I go to the next slide, mm, uh, there's also a meeting that we have this afternoon in terms of uh, revamping the uh, curriculum. This is happening in all the four divisions, but um, I'm involved primarily with the structures curriculum. So in terms of the uh, kind of courses that you have, uh, of course, this is a core course uh, and you, have, you are taking it. But uh, for those of you who are specializing in structures or have some interest in structures apart from some other area and would have to want to take electives, et cetera, uh, going forward, um, if you have any suggestions in terms of, because you would have looked at the scheme of instructions, the courses that we have already and which are being offered on a regular basis. and uh, uh, which uh, you might have heard from your seniors, etc. So uh, if you have any suggestions in terms of what kind of uh, additional courses you would like uh, in the future, uh, keeping the current trends in mind, because some of you are from the armed forces, some from the uh, from ISRO, DRDO, etc. Uh, your inputs are very important in terms of, because the whole idea of this uh, course, the uh, MTech course, is to uh, make you better for the industry, uh, make you better fit for the industry in terms of when you go back. So are we catering to the kind of courses that are required? And if uh, changes need to be made, I'm sure it is made because uh, we typically do this once in 10 years and there's a lot of change that goes through uh, during this process. So if you have anything, uh, feel free. Either you can tell me at the end of the class or uh, you could even shoot me an email and uh, we'll, s we'll see if we can take that into consideration. So. Continuing, uh, uh, the next thing that I would like to go, go into is we have looked at it in a different perspective earlier, uh, many different ways of uh, classifying aerospace structures. One we would like to focus on a uh, little more today and before we get on to materials is the load-based uh, classification of the components. And um, uh, many of these we have already uh, talked about in many different uh, contexts, but we are trying to uh, put them all together in a uh, formal way. Uh, before going, uh, we have seen uh, quite a few cutouts in the previous class as well mm, uh, in terms of uh, once you remove the skin, how the uh, structure looks like. Uh, typically, the longitudinal uh, stiffening members. So this is essentially for the nose cone of a particular aircraft where uh, it's the assembly drawing that you have. Uh, so this is the bulkhead that we were talking about, for example, um, the rear bulkhead. And now this is the uh, uh, forward bulkhead that we have. Uh, and uh, typically for cutouts, how you have these doublers and things like that. I've, uh, mentioned in a previous class as well, but essentially you look at the cross-sectional geometries of those are much larger. Uh, in other words, more area and more uh, mark per unit length uh, uh, as you go along the perimeter compared to, let's say, an individual stringer, etc. And um, the formers, in addition to the uh, fully uh, cross-section occupying bulkheads, you have these uh, formers which are essentially the parallel to the transverse ribs that we saw in the wings, and uh, you see that. And also, there also you typically have cutouts. Uh, rather than for uh, passing something, it's more for the weight reduction, for the more of the structural efficiency that uh, typically uh, that you have so many uh, cutouts because uh, many of these are taking uh, loads which are essentially like bending. So you can think of this as a curved beam if you look at the whole thing because the cross-sectional dimensions are small compared to the overall uh, length of it, which is the perimeter, which is about 2 pi times the radius of that location at which it is there. And it changes from one to the other. And some locations, the spacing is much closer compared to the other locations where the spacing is. So one is in terms of the um, size, the shape, the spacing, and how they are eventually joined to the overall thing in a seamless fashion. So uh, that way, because these joints otherwise can become critical areas, where even if you have de designed each of these individual components appropriately, if you have not joined them uh, appropriately, uh, they could become the source of a damage and a failure uh, eventually. Uh, 
So uh, coming to the load-based uh, component classification, um, we have seen that there are certain components, like for example, these stringers or longerons, in which uh, the primary load that is going to be there is uh, essentially, uh, you're talking about the axial force. So the axial force, um, and then the, uh, you, the axial force, it can, could be positive or negative, and depending upon that, you either call it a bar or a column, that is tension or compression. Uh, and for the same two uh, entities, we had used a different uh, name earlier on uh, in, in terms of a history, uh, what we called as the ties and struts. So the ties are uh, more commonly called as bars today, and the struts are more commonly called as columns today. Uh, there are certain areas where it continues to be called as strut, for example, in the landing gear, etc. So uh, that's, that's essentially what it is. But the important thing to uh, recognize is that these are essentially one-dimensional structures in the sense that you have the cross-sectional dimension, uh, which is much smaller compared to the overall length. So uh, what we are trying to do is to see where these components are in the actual aircraft. One is, of course, the spar of the wing. But uh, spar, uh, if only you look at it as a whole, then you are looking at bending as the main load rather than axial force. But if you're looking at the spar cap, or you're looking at these stringers and longerons that we just talked about, either in the wing or in the fuselage, that's where these axial forces come prominence. Uh, another place where uh, a primary um, load-bearing element is uh, predominantly under uh, axial loads is the uh, case of the uh, helicopter rotor blade flex beam. So essentially, these flex beams are skeletal structures within the aircraft, just like you have a skeletal structure in the fuselage of a fixed-wing aircraft. Uh, this could, for all you know, be very similar to what you have in the fuselage of a um, helicopter as well. But essentially, what you're talking about is, um, uh, in terms of the primary load-carrying uh, member, like instead of the wing, you have the rota rotary wing over here. The and the skeletal structure there is the flex beam. And for a lot of these um, uh, smaller uh, rotors, uh, and also for larger helicopters, with uh, even for the tail rotor, you typically have uh, these flex beams, uh, which are also uh, predominantly axial load uh, carrying members. Then uh, next you have the uh, case of the next major load that comes the torque. Um, I'm not ordering it in any particular way because bending would probably be the uh, most stringent because of the lift distribution on the aircraft wing. So it's just there are all these terms. So again, a 1D structure. Essentially, you're talking about a shaft uh, where the torque is predominant. And um, though it's been called a shaft uh, more from the point of view of um, transferring a dynamic torque, uh, typically uh, from a rotating system to another, uh, this is something that is used even in the static terminology. Uh, in the case of the wing, for example, you could have what is known as the wing box that we talked about. So wing box is not a um, a shaft, so to speak, but essentially it's doing the same job as far as the material and structures are concerned. It's taking a certain level of shear stress in order to uh, accomplish um, the bearing of the torque that comes. Uh, in the case of the wing, it's because of the pitching moment. It's also because of the moment arm that the uh, concentrated forces have, namely the um, engine weight, the uh, engine thrust. Uh, compared to where uh, the center of twist is. And then also other things that you can have in an, a military aircraft, like the ammunition, uh, et cetera. So from all of those, you typically have these loads coming in, which could uh, be off center in a sense, uh, therefore causing this torque. And you have to be able to handle that uh, torque. Essentially, again, this is a one dimensional structure. And in particular, in the uh, wing, this is formed, as we saw in the previous class, uh, uh, by the skin on the top the skin at the bottom, and the webs of the front spar and the rear spar, or if there are multiple spars, all of them as well. So this essentially forms a box. Uh, in other words, a closed cross-section, which is thin-walled, and therefore very efficient in taking torsion. May not be as efficient as a circular cross-section, but um, the requirement there is that you can't uh, have the overall geometry is predefined for you already in terms of the airfoil cross-section that this is supposed to have. Within that, you're trying to fit in the best possible closed section, which is thin-walled, which will take as much of the torque as possible with less stresses. Uh, the next thing that uh, we have is, of course, the bending moment. Uh, 
um, which as I said is the major thing, com uh, especially coming from the lift distribution on the um, uh, wing and then also the drag distribution which bends it in the uh, orthogonal direction. And so both of these, because the lift and the drag, remember, are not defined with respect to the structural geometry, but with respect to the velocity vector. So the airflow velocity uh, determines in parallel to that direction, uh, all of the aerodynamic forces are integrated or the aerodynamic pressures and shears are integrated to give you what is known as the drag and perpendicular to the velocity vector, what you have as the integrated force over the uh, overall surface is what is your lift. So these two orthogonal forces uh, over their distributions essentially are causing uh, a certain bending that is happening. And even when the aircraft is on the ground, you, you still have a bending because of the self weight of the wing, the uh, weight of the uh, engine, and of course the uh, weight of whatever else is in it, uh, like the fuel and uh, the other attachments like the sensors, wing tips, uh, the wing tips, etc., the armaments, etc., all of those are going to contribute as well. Uh, and many of these are going to be in relief. And uh, while it is flying, of course, uh, not only the drag, but also the thrust of the engines is going to bend it. Again, it's going to be bending in an opposite direction. So you have to take uh, that into account as well. And of course, it's a concentrated load, unlike the drag distributions, which is throughout. So up from the wing tip up to this point, you will have just the bending due to the drag, which means that it is bending in the other direction. And then if the thrust is large enough, it might bend it in the opposite direction. and then. Um, you know, the net effect could be that it's actually bending forward. So you, you have to, on a case-by-case -case basis, look at all of these numbers in order to calculate to see exactly the not only the magnitudes of these bending moments, but also the direction in which it is. Because why is the direction important? Uh, the magnitude of the bending moment will help us with the design, right? How does it matter whether the bending moment is uh, bringing the wingtip forward or backward? Anybody? for a structural designer, how, how, how does that information on the direction of the bending moment matter? So in this case, both are called as MZ, right? So uh, Z being the direction uh, downward. Uh, so essentially, uh, if MZ is positive or MZ is negative, how does it matter if it's the same value magnitude? What uh, difference does it make to a structural designer in terms of the decision making? True, true. That is from a flight mechanics point of view. Let, I, I'm asking from a structural engineer point of view. I'm designing this with certain choice of materials, such a certain choice of shapes, etc. Yeah, that we will anyway do, but whether it is um, M is positive or negative. M. Yes, the Excellent, yeah. So that's the point. So as she pointed out, depending upon whether MZ is positive or negative, which elements are go undergoing tension and which elements are undergoing compression will interchange. So for example, if it's the bending moment is in this direction, you know that the rear spar is undergoing uh, compression because of that. Of course, we're just talking of drag over here. It's the same uh, with the lift as well. I'm just using this for illustration. Both of them will get added up in an algebraic sense. But essentially what we are talking about is, mm, uh, let's come back and probably look at the lift distribution. So the fact that it is in this direction means that I have to design not only the top skin for compression, but even the top stringers and also the top spar cap for I have to use a material which is better performing in compression and also make sure that it is designed for buckling as well so that it doesn't fail in buckling. Yeah, the skin might fail in buckling, but you do not want the spar caps and or stringers to fail in buckling. So you want to ensure that. So you want to use first materials which are better performing in compression on the top. So many a times you will see different material being used for the tops and for the bottom, um, if you take the corresponding structural elements, skin to skin, or stringer to stringer, or spar cap to spar cap, you, you would see there is a difference. So in other words, there is an asymmetry that is uh, developed purposely because you know in terms of the requirement, it's quite different from that. So it's not just the magnitude of uh, any moment. Uh, MZ is what we were talking about, but the other uh, moment is essentially MX. 
which is the bending, because X is the axis typically on the aircraft you draw along the um, zero lift line uh, passing through the nose. Uh, so uh, the moment about that is what is caused by the lift distribution. And that MX uh, also it changes whether the aircraft is uh, on the ground or whether it's in the air, uh, flying in the air or it's doing certain uh, maneuvers, especially for acrobatic aircraft and or certain military aircraft when you have negative load factors going on. So you have to make sure that it's taken care of there as well. So just because uh, for the dominant uh, situation, the top is under compression, the bottom is under tension. If I don't design the bottom for uh, compression, you could be in trouble sometimes. So you have to take that entire range into account that uh, typically you would see that uh, compression dominated design for the top and uh, tension dominated design for the bottom. But there will also be a certain range of compression uh, at the uh, bottom and uh, the tension at the top that you have to design these structural components for. So um, you have to take all the extreme cases and make sure that uh, all of these requirements are taken care of. So that's as far as the bending moment uh, is concerned. So the common thing that you see, and typically these are called as beams in uh, typical uh, literature and also the um, kind of community, the terminology that they use. But whether it is a bar or column or a shaft or a beam or a wing box, as we saw in this particular case, uh, all of them are essentially one-dimensional structures because their cross-sectional dimension is small compared to the length. And therefore, uh, what, what is the current trend in the industry is to not treat them individually as separate uh, structural components, bring in a common paradigm to treat all of them using a so-called 1D model, uh, which will take care of not only each of those uh, individually, but also the couplings that can happen between them. Because first of all, right from the airfoil cross section, you can have an asymmetry because of the camber that you need, uh, especially in the wing. And uh, once you have that asymmetry in geometry, then you have, as we just talked about, the kind of materials that you use on the top and the bottom. There's a material asymmetry which goes. And then in terms of the cross sections of these stringers and etc that you're using on the top and the bottom there could be an asymmetry that is coming so asymmetry is coming because of many many different reasons and all of this uh, and of course you're using instead of metals which were isotropic you're using anisotropic composites they, they bring in their own material couplings so geometric and material couplings would mean that when there is an axial force yes the load might be just one, but in terms of the response of the structure, it may not just extend, but it might also twist, it might also get curved. Uh, all these things can happen as a secondary effect, and you have to uh, have a model which takes care of all that. Similarly, when there is a torque, once again, there could be an extension, there is a possibility of the bending, etc. So, and again, bending moment itself is in two different directions, two different orthogonal directions, and many cases people are aware that these two are coupled with each other in terms of the curvature, uh, especially for um, uh, structural cross sections which are not doubly symmetric. So then you have to take that into account as well because there's a non-zero product of, uh, moment of inertia that is associated even in the simplest model that you can uh, think of. But we can develop a more involved 1D model which will take care of each one of these direct effects, indirect effects due to coupling and also so-called non-linear effects. Because even though the material itself might still be operating in a so-called linear elastic regime, in other words, the stress-strain uh, relationship at 3D level remains uh, linear. At the 1D level, when you're talking about the stiffness matrix, it is essentially what you call as EA in this case, or a GJ in this case, or a EI2 and EI3 in this case. All of those things might change because your, even though the material probably remains okay, in E doesn't change or G doesn't change, but your A, the cross-sectional area can change because of the Poisson's effect. Your uh, J can change, undergo a small change. Your uh, I2 and I3 and also I2, 3, uh, which is essentially the product moment of inertia, those all can undergo small changes, which means that there is a certain non-linearity, even when the material is linearly elastic because of the geometry, and this is particularly true with the thin wall geometries that uh, we are dealing with over here, they undergo much more deformations within the cross section, and that can bring about quite a lar large change. Because remember that even though 1.5 might look large compared to the factors of safety that we have 
in many other engineering applications, this is quite stringent. And so, in other words, we are stretching the limits uh, as far as the material performance is concerned. We are uh, not very close to the uh, failure limits, but we are operating uh, at fairly large stress levels. And also, for the cover skin, in fact, we are allowing it to uh, geometrically fail, though materially it still uh, doesn't fail uh, through the elastic instabilities that we are allowing it to have. So in other words, the strains and stresses that are involved could be stretching the limits, and therefore we have to make sure that those nonlinearities are also taken into account. And when there is nonlinearity, as we already discussed earlier, you can't uh, treat each one of them separately and uh, think that later on I will put them all together. Principle of superposition doesn't work over there. And therefore, you have to ground up, develop a common model for the so-called one-dimensional structures. And there are four primary loads that you're going to deal with always. Uh, we will denote this by F1 because it's along the X1 direction. Uh, we will denote this by M1. Because it's a moment about the uh, X1 direction once again. And uh, similarly, you are going to be dealing with this as uh, M2 and M3, which are about the X2 and X3 directions. So these four forces, uh, we call, even though these are moments, we will call it as forces in a generalized sense. Like when we say generalized displacement, it includes rotations as well. When we say generalized forces, it includes not only forces, but the moments as well. Now, uh, typically, you know, for a rigid body, uh, you typically have, uh, if it's a 3D rigid body, you have six degrees of freedom, the three translations and the three rotations. But here, we are actually talking about, about only four uh, quantities. In other words, there are three moments which are associated with the three rotations, namely M1, M2, and M3. But here, you're talking only of an F1. You're not talking of an F2 and F3. This is a very, very important thing to remember because the F2 and F3, remember, are essentially your transverse shears. Okay, And we already discussed this, whether it's a plate where we're talking about the stresses in the thickness direction or in the beam where you're talking about the uh, shear stresses within the cross section. These are high, typically higher order effects compared to the other stresses that are there. For example, the uh, lift and the drag and the thrust will cause much larger sigma 1, 1, that is along the x1 direction, that's the normal stress, compared to a sigma 1, 2 uh, in this direction or a sigma 1, 3 in this direction. So those are there. It's not non-zero, but those are higher order effects. So when we uh, derive this uh, using the current state of the art math and physics, it so happens that in terms of the contribution to the energy, uh, because remember that uh, in reality, all of these are 3D, but we are modeling it as 1D, which means there's a dimensional reduction going on of two levels from 3 to uh, 3D to 1D. 3 minus 1 is 2. So two levels of dimensional reduction that you're doing. And when you do this in an, uh, with the rigorous math and physics that is involved, you will see that automatically your, the effects of F2 and F3 will drop off. And therefore, you'll have this effect. Does it mean that we are not able to take into account those failures that could happen because of F2, F3, et cetera? No, because this is as far as the overall working of the model is concerned. But there is what is known as so-called recovery, where once the model has been solved for, you can go and get back all those transverse stresses as well, the transverse strain distributions, all the deformations which are happening out of that. So purely based on the mathematics without making assumptions, as long as your cross-sectional dimension is small compared to the length, automatically your F2 and F3 will drop out of the system and you will have only one of the forces and essentially a beam model will, have, will be a four degree of freedom system as far as the cross-section is concerned. But along the length, of course, it still remains a continuous body. So any continuous body will have infinite degrees of freedom. Now we're talking only of a cross-section. Remember, we are shrinking that cross-section, which is of a finite area, to a zero area point. So uh, the area becomes a point. And when we are doing that, we are lumping. You, have, uh, you probably have, have heard from various other contexts, a uh, lumped mass model, et cetera. So essentially, you are essentially lumping all of that uh, material distribution to a single point. And when you're doing that, and you're doing it uh, in a mathematically accurate way, uh, taking into account the small parameters that is associated with cross-sectional dimension divided by the length, or even in a dynamics problem, divided by the wavelength instead, the dominant wavelength, in both these cases, you would see that 
there are certain things drop off and which is what makes the 1D model so much more computationally efficient. One is, uh, instead of in a statics problem, you're now solving an ordinary differential equation because x1 is the only variable. No longer x2 and x3 are variables. But, but in addition, you have these kinds of advantages also happening as we just discussed, which is going to make it even more uh, computationally efficient. What is that? Instead of six degrees of freedom, you're having only four within the cross section and you're going to deal with so many cross sections along the length because it's still a continuous system as far as the length is concerned, which is a large uh, dimension. Therefore, uh, uh, there's a multiplying effect dropping from six to four and then dealing with the uh, entire beam. So you have a huge uh, advantage uh, going on from there, from that point of view also from the computation. But if you want to explicitly get that F2 and F3, that is also possible within the same paradigm. Essentially, you're forcing two, um, what you call as artificial degrees of freedom into it, and introduce F2 and F3 separately, and deal with that also. It's, it's, that's a possibility. But essentially, uh, you're working with more number of degrees of freedom than is actually necessary for the problem. And both can eventually lead to the same results. So you might as well work with a computationally more efficient model, and then work back back to get uh, those shear stresses, et cetera, when you need it, where you need it. So uh, those are the three as far as the 1D is concerned. The next that we have to look at is the essentially the shear force that we are looking at. And uh, for the shear force, we already saw it's the, tr uh, the primary thing. It's the in-plane shear force. And the best way to deal with is uh, more of a plate or shell-like structure that uh, we were talking about earlier. So. Uh, in this case, uh, one example is the cover skin. The other example is uh, the webs of your spars. So typically, both together uh, contribute there. And um, they're uh, effectively resisting many different kinds of shear. One kind of shear is already coming from the torque that we talked about. That torque-related uh, shear stress is very different from what we are talking of here as a transverse shear stress, which is coming from the bending, which is the lift and the drag. So essentially, the transverse uh, effects that are there, that you have to uh, take care of by appropriately designing your laminate, how uh, you order the uh, materials, because the transfer shear uh, stresses are typically much larger in the center compared to on the outer plies. So you would want to have your, in, uh, when you're designing a laminated structure with a composite, you want to ensure that the top uh, uh, plies and the bottommost plies are good at taking the axial loads, bending and uh, which is coming from bending typically, and or axial loads. Essentially, compression and tension they should be good at taking. So you would find a lot of these zero degree fibers over there. On the other hand, you want to uh, ensure that as far as the middle region is concerned, you have greater transverse shear carrying capability rather than axial load carrying capability. And that's why you see a lot of sandwich constructions being used where the, uh, you have a composite uh, face sheets on the top and the bottom, but the in-between region is either uh, built out of foam or a honey, al aluminum honeycomb kind of a structure, which is having a lot of pores, essentially. Uh, it's not good at all in tension and or compression. It will easily fail, but it will be able to handle a lot of shear loads, wh which is what is dominating over there. But in any case, the maximum shear load which occurs, which is typically at the neutral axis, for example, is still far, far smaller compared to the uh, axial stresses that are there, that is sigma 1, 1. So it's essentially a higher order effect, but still something that needs to be taken into account. Otherwise, there is a possibility of failure originating there and eventually spreading to other locations. So. That's as far as the shear force is concerned. And when the shear force is concerned, you typically have uh, more like panels or shells. And uh, these are essentially uh, uh, structures where one dimension is small compared to the other two dimensions. So if you're uh, looking at, uh, let's say, uh, three dimensions associated with any structure, one is the length, the other is the breadth, and the other is the height. So what we are talking about in the case of these three, uh, that is the so-called one-dimensional structure, is that your L is very large compared to either B or H, right? And uh, in this case, what is happening is that your L and B are very large compared to your height 
or h, which is essentially the thickness in this case. So, so you're talking of the height over here, which means that the thickness that you're talking about is very small compared to the length L and the breadth B. And typically, uh, we will use the coordinate system such that this is x1. Along x1, the uh, whatever dimension it is, we'll call it as uh, length. Along x2, whatever it is, we'll call it as breadth. So L for length, B for breadth. And x3 is the notation we will use for the height, which essentially is in many cases the thickness that is involved. So uh, many cases it might be a more complex structure. So we will use uh, different components which are joined to each other. So T is something that we'll use for the individual thickness, how it varies different locations. But H is the overall uh, beams uh, height that we are talking about. So it's very clear to see that there is a, a very uh, clear distinction that happens between 1D and 2D, where L is very large compared to B and H in one case. The other case, H is very small compared to L and B. So essentially, one uh, dimension is something where you can do a dimensional reduction. Therefore, 3D becomes 2D in this case. Here, there are two dimensions with respect to uh, which you can do the dimensional reduction. Therefore, there's a, a, a two levels of dimensional reduction from 3D to 1D that is happening over here. Now, uh, can you think of examples where, uh, of course, all structures are three-dimensional. And uh, there are certain structures which can be modeled as 1D because of this reason, length being very large compared to breadth and uh, the height. There are certain other uh, kind of geometries where the length and breadth are very large compared to the height. Therefore, you can deal with as 2D. But all of these structures in reality are 3D, and therefore 3D modeling is definitely possible and probably the best that you can get in terms of the accuracy levels. But if you have done the dimensional reduction properly, the, uh, the drop in accuracy would be of the order of 1% or so, which is something that you can live with. So that being the case, uh, can you think of examples where a structure, of course, all structures can be considered as 3D. Certain can be considered apart from 3D as 1D. Certain others can be considered as three, uh, 2D apart from 3D. Are there structures that you can think of which you can consider as 3D, 2D, as well as 1D, based on this uh, division that we have talked about, the definition that we have talked about? Hmm? Okay, so for example, this former that you're talking about, or a you're talking of a bulkhead, OK? Yes, the bulkhead will be thicker. So yeah. So the bulkhead, uh, you're saying that the thickness is small compared to the uh, o other. The bulkhead will have yeah. a uh, greater thickness. Yeah. So it has to be considered Correct. Uh, uh, as we go to frames, mm -hmm. it, the thickness tends to reduce uh, to some extent. True, true. So if you take this uh, frame, for example, you're essentially saying that the thickness is small compared to? As compared to a bulkhead. Uh, to, uh, for the, as compared to the uh, cycle pressure. Right, so so that essentially is taking care of this, that the perimeter is what is L over there, and the thickness is over here, and uh, the width is B. So compared to B and H, yes, L is large, so it will be treated as a beam. How can it be treated as a shell? I want an example where it can be treated both as 1D as well as 2D. Anyway, everything can be treated as 3D. That's a different issue. Let's keep that aside, OK? Are there examples where you can treat a particular structure uh, as both 1D as well as 2D? Which means both this condition as well as this condition should be satisfied. You can easily think of how both of these conditions can be simultaneously satisfied. example that you pointed out is right, but the reasoning has to come using this. Okay? The skin of the uh, fuselage or any, any skin. Okay. Yes, the skin has a thickness or height which is very small compared to length and breadth. But how is the other one? That reduce the, like, the mm -hmm. 
correct right 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 so but uh, in terms of lb and h what is the ordering that happens uh, in terms of yeah. large and small yeah. in that case if l and b are in the same range then it becomes only a 2d it doesn't become 1d right here you want a difference between l and b right here you have a difference between l and b on the one hand and h here you have a huge difference between L and B and H on the other hand. So how do you order these in such a way that there is a difference between all three is what you want. You can go back to your example what you talked about. L is the per perimeter over there. H is the thickness over there. And B is the breadth. So is there a way in which you can think of them as different orders of magnitude? Uh -huh. Or go back to your example where you talked about a skin, where you're thinking of uh, spacing it in such a way that you're, anyway for the skin, the height is small, the height, by height I mean the thickness, because I'm using this terminology H for it. So that is small compared to the perimeter. But these are only two dimensions that you have talked about, which is the thickness and the perimeter. There's a third dimension associated with every structure, right? What is that third dimension there? Yeah, uh, we'll call the perimeter as length because that is what you have. The third dimension is essentially the width or breadth that you're talking about, right? So you want to have all three of different orders of magnitude. That is essentially what you are about to say something. Yeah, you can specify exactly what you want. Exactly. The intermediate is the word that I was looking for. Essentially, you are talking about same order, L, B, H. Here also L, B, H. But here you are pairing two together. Here also you are pairing two together. The paired ones are small in this case. The paired ones are large in this case. So the case where you can treat all of them simultaneously is where you have L very large compared to B, which is in turn very large compared to H. B is large compared to H, right? So it's a two level of, uh, so let's say this is about 1000 mm, this is about 100 mm, this is about 10 mm, the order of magnitude of these things. So essentially uh, B is also large compared to H. So uh, because of the fact that L and B are large compared to H, you are able to treat it as a plate or a 2D model. Because of the fact that L is large compared to B and H, you are still able to treat it as a uh, beam, right? So essentially what you're doing is, uh, instead of uh, going for, and not all structures will be amenable to this. The kind of examples that you gave are uh, right examples where you can think of so, something like this, where the thickness is small compared to the breadth, um, and the breadth is small compared to the length. But the thickness is not very small compared to the breadth. So I may not be able to treat this as a plate or a shell. I might be able to treat it as a beam. But uh, the, uh, in your school, your geometry boxes, you would have had a ruler, the scale. So that's essentially very thin compared to its width. And uh, the width is small compared to its length. So that's a classic case where you can treat it. In aerospace structures, we were just referring to it in a different context uh, a few minutes back, is the flex beam of a helicopter rotor blade, which is a thin rectangular cross section. So in other words, it's a long beam. But each cross section is a thin rectangle like this. So in other words, this is the breadth, this is the height, and then it, uh, it's a very long length, which is essentially the radius of that rotor that you're having. So in that case, the cross section, if, if it's a thin rectangle that you have, what you typically call as a strip. So a thin rectangular strip is what you would call it. And it could be OK that it is tapered or whatever. But what you're concerned is, uh, even at the maximum uh, breadth, Still, the breadth is small compared to the length. And the breadth is, uh, even at the smallest breadth, still the breadth is small compared to the height. So therefore, you can uh, do in such cases, uh, or even uh, you could take a, a circular tube. One you considered a case where the sleeve is what you're considering, so that the breadth is small compared to the length. And in turn, the breadth is large compared to the height. Uh, 
But you can also think of it as a long uh, tube. In the long tube, what happens is, again, the thickness is small compared to the perimeter. But the perimeter is small compared to the length of the tube. So once again, you have a LBH difference. In that case, also, you can treat it both as a shell model as well as. Of course, for the shell, the boundary conditions will be uh, periodic. In other words, it comes around, and therefore, it's a closed cross section. So you have to have the displacement and the stresses matching when it comes back. So that's essentially what you're going to be talking about. So that is the uh, scenario that we have. There are cases where you can treat it only as 1D. There are scenarios where you treat it as only as 2D. Those are the more common things. And But there are aerospace examples where both are possible. And which you would choose over there? You would choose a 1D if uh, computational efficiency is prime importance for you. Or you would choose a 2D if the accuracy is more of importance to you. But even this, if you had done your 1D reduction properly, you would still probably, the drop in accuracy from this to this would be about half a percent or less than that. So typically, you might still end up dealing with these as 1D. But uh, where this really helps that ha you have this uh, uh, two-level uh, gradation instead of a one-level gradation is the fact that uh, you can, in the dimensional reduction process, which I said is very difficult, jumping from uh, uh, 3D to 1D, because you have to drop it by two dimensions, it's very difficult to develop an accurate uh, beam model. But uh, if you have this uh, scenario in a helicopter rotor flex beam, for example, you can first drop it from a 3D model to a shell model, and then from a shell model to eventually a beam model. The process also is simple, and eventually you end up with uh, the same result whether you had gone directly from 3D to 1D as well. Correct. See, it, it always has to be by the configuration, because you want the problem definition to dictate your assumptions. You do not want to make any additional assumptions over and beyond the problem definitions. The problem uh, uh, defines your geometry for an analysis, for example. Uh, or in a design, you're trying to move towards that geometry, but you know that that geometry that you want to move to still has some uh, ordering of uh, dimensions in either in this fashion, this fashion, or this fashion, one of these three. So uh, the configuration is what uh, uh, defines and eventually uh, defines not only the model, but also the end results. So uh, because it's purely from the configuration that we are uh, deciphering these aspects. And what you consider as small is also important. Would you consider 1 tenth as small? Would you consider 120, 1 by 20 as small? What are, that depends upon the kind of accuracies that you're moving to, and also how many steps of this uh, uh, procedure you want to apply. Based on that, you have to decide what is a small parameter. So the typical thumb, um, uh, thumb line or thumb mark you have is, in terms of thumb rule rather, is that uh, one tenth is a reasonably small uh, quantity where from for engineering accuracy purpose. Even a one level or two level uh, derivation of the theory would be good enough. Uh, for your dimensionally, the, both both of these, whether it's 1D or 2D, are called as dimensionally reduced theories because you have di dimensionally reduced from 3D. And both of these will work very well as long as you have uh, this difference between the large quantity and small quantity of the order of 10. Okay, the ratio of 10. Okay, thank you. So, uh, do any of you want to mention any courses or curricula changes?